Hey, what's going on everybody? So this is the Sub-Saharan Savanna here in West Africa. This is actually Ghana. And this is home to the world's most popular pet monitor lizard, the Savanna Monitor, or if you're watching from Europe, the Bosque Monitor Lizard. And even though the Savanna Monitor is the world's most popular pet monitor lizard, there is so little known about its natural history out here in Africa. So while I'm here in West Africa, I'm going to investigate how the Savannah Monitor is living out here in the wild so that we better know how to care for them in our homes. I'm Dave Kaufman and these are my reptile adventures. Rainbow Mealworms is not only a proud sponsor of this channel, they are the premier source for all your reptile food needs. They grow all of their quality insects in-house and I use them exclusively for all my insect-eating reptiles. So place your order today at rainbowmealworms.net or click the link in the description below. So this is the savanna monitor's habitat here in sub-Saharan Ghana. Just grasslands as far as you can see. And of, and of course, like everywhere else, they build a road and irrigation ditches right in the middle of this habitat. But as I walk through this grassland here, you can see that the ground is this kind of sand mixed with dirt. It's really loose soil. And this is really good for savanna monitors to burrow in. It's easy to dig in. It's not too compact. And as you can see, look at this, just about a few centimeters underneath the surface, and that is nice and wet and moist. It's only on the surface that it's dry. And that is really key because the reason why savanna monitors burrow in this is to get away from that hot sun, even though they are sun loving and they are active during the day, they do need a retreat from it and they do need hot, humid retreats. And so this really moist soil just underneath the surface here is perfect for savanna monitors to burrow in, find refuge from the sun, and to find humidity underground in their burrows. So if you look at this habitat of savanna monitors, they have plenty of places to roam. And therefore, for your enclosures at home, you know, I see so many people keep savanna monitors in really small enclosures. They need really huge enclosures. I know people that keep savanna monitors in a horse trough, and that might actually be a little too small for them. And so people often make the mistake of keeping them in 20 gallon longs with no substrate to burrow in, and that is just too small of an enclosure. They need a lot of really loose, moist soil in which to burrow in, and they need places to roam. And a commercially made 20 gallon or bigger, even 40 breeder, is going to be too small for an adult savanna monitor. Again, they need lots of substrate and they need lots of places to roam like they do out here in West Africa. But as you can see, look at this, it's the beginning of the wet season and even a month ago, this was bone dry out here. And so again, the savanna monitors are just starting their active period out here. And if you wait long enough around a water source like this, you'll see savannas come out of the savanna and start drinking here. So, but we don't have enough time to sit here by this water source and wait for a savanna to come to us. We've got to be a little more assertive if we want to see a savanna monitor out here. All right, so look at this little savanna monitor. This is this year's baby. When they hatch, they start immediately feeding and they just gorge themselves. And again, they're hatching at the beginning of the wet season and they're gorging themselves on insects and frogs and scorpions and snails, crickets, other things, and they grow fast. So this is this year's baby, look at this little dude. And this is a wild savanna monitor and look at how chill he is. And this is why people are attracted to savanna monitors because out of all the monitor species, they are just little puppy dogs, even in the wild. 
We just picked this guy up off the ground, and look at this. He's just sitting in my hand. He's not trying to bite. He's not trying to get away. He's probably digging the heat of my hand. So it is brutally hot here in the Savannah Monitors range, and I'll take some humidity and temperature readings here in a little bit, but I found some shade underneath this tree, and this is a perfect place to start talking about a diet for your Savannah Monitor. If you're feeding mice and rats exclusively to your Savannah Monitor, stop it. Stop it right now. They are not eating rodents of any kind out here. Perhaps in the dry season, when food is a little bit more scarce, they may scavenge on rodents and other types of meat, but their main diet is actually insects. Even an adult will eat insects, and they are also specialized at eating snails. I'm in the range of the African giant snail, and there's tons of other snail species out here, and savannah monitors actually have teeth that are specialized for crunching through those hard snail shells and eating the gooey goodness inside. So I've read so many care sheets that tell you to feed rodents to your savannah monitor, and that is absolutely dead wrong. If you're feeding your savannah monitor exclusively rodents, and I've made this mistake with savannah monitors in the past when I first started keeping, but rodents equal fat, and a fat lizard will equal a dead lizard. At least one that won't live as long. Obesity is a terrible problem when keeping savannah monitors because we are feeding them food that they don't eat out here in the wild. We are feeding them fat-rich foods like rodents, and we're doing it almost exclusively, and it is so wrong. So if you're working with your first Savannah monitor and you have a little baby, crickets, mealworms, dubias, perfect diet for them. They are insectivorous out here, and the babies are eating almost exclusively insects, and sometimes they'll eat tiny snails, but the adults, they love snails, and a really great place to get snails is at a Chinese market in your area. So again, even if you're keeping adults, they are insectivorous and they are mollusk eaters out here. So immediately switch them off of rodents and get them on super huge dubias or snails or other insects and mollusks like those. And savannah monitors of all sizes, they love millipedes. And researchers out here in West Africa have actually observed a adult savanna monitors rubbing their chin on millipedes, which causes them to secrete their toxins. And they'll do this over and over again until the millipede stops releasing those toxins. Then they will go and eat the millipede toxin-free, which probably tastes a little better. These are really incredible monitor lizards, and they're much more intelligent than we give them credit for. But again, these are this year's babies, and look at how big they are. That one has some really nice markings, some really nice browns and yellows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the poop stain I don't think is genetic, so let's not get excited. And look at how fat and robust their bellies are. These guys are eating very well out here. Are you seeing savanna monitors more out during the evening, like now, or more out during the heat of the day? Yeah, the savanna monitor, if you want to find them, you come early in the morning. When you come early in the morning, because of the grass, the water, water, the, the, the dew, grass. yep. So they're hanging out at the entrance of their burrows in the morning. Yes. And they're drinking the dew off the leaves. Yeah. And then they go out hunting. Yes. Are you finding more savanna monitors underground or more out walking around? Yeah, sometimes they're walking, but you have to go around for looking the feeding. Right, they have to go hunting. Yes. Yes. They have to go hunting. So they come out of their burrows, they find a lot of insects to eat, and then they go right back into their burrows before yeah. the cobras and other snakes can find them to eat them. That's it. Gotcha. And the baby like this, we have some crickets, baby crickets, where did they look in the hole? They, that's the cricket hole. Yeah, when he's feeding by the, the cricket, in, then he, he keeping the hole. So as I said, it's the beginning of the wet season, and look at this, there's all these vernal ponds forming here, and this one is full of frogs. And savanna monitors, aside from eating snails and insects, will also come and eat all of these amphibians, especially the juveniles. So they do have a varied diet here in Africa, but what they're not eating, again, is rodents. All right, so let's take some temperature and humidity readings. I'm gonna put this meter right here, and I'm gonna let that cook for a little bit, so that we get an accurate 
humidity and temperature reading of what the ambient temperature is out here on the savanna. And look at that, about 68% relative humidity, but the ambient temperature where savanna monitors are spending most of their time on the ground, it's 33 degrees Celsius, which is 92, let's just say, degrees Fahrenheit. I'm gonna test the UV index here. Holy crap. 11.3. That is higher than any other reading I've ever taken anywhere in the world. On the Ferguson zone, the reading is 11.3 for UV. That is astounding. So Africa, it's really difficult to get around. We're maybe 50 miles north of Accra, and it took us about three and a half hours to get 50 miles. And the downside of that is that we're here just about three o'clock in the afternoon and it's hazy here. So I'm not gonna be able to get an accurate reading at this area of what the surface temperature is that the savanna monitors are out here basking. But I will say that the surface temperature at the time of day that savanna monitors are most active is about 120 degrees. And therefore, in your enclosures, you need to provide them with a really, really hot, hot spot of about 120, even 130 degrees. And you will find that your savanna monitor will be basking underneath that heat lamp at those temperatures. So I really think that half the problem of why savanna Savannah monitors have this reputation of not being very long-lived is because of the way that we're keeping them. We are keeping them far too cold and we are keeping them far too dry because we expect the savanna out here to be hot and dry and therefore we're keeping our savanna monitors hot and dry. 70% relative humidity, it's not dry but we do need to keep them hot. An ambient temperature in the lower 90s and a hot spot of about 120 to 130 degrees is perfect for your savanna monitor. But also when you give them that hot spot, make sure it's on one third of the cage so that they have a hot spot on one side and a cool spot on the other so that they can retreat from that hot side to that cool side to help them better thermoregulate. So we walked for miles over the course of a few hours here in the savanna monitor's habitat in the sub-Saharan part of Ghana. But I'm curious as to how savanna monitors are living in other countries. So while our time in Ghana has come to an end, we're gonna head across the border into Togo to see how savanna monitors are living over there. All right guys, so I'm in Togo right now and I'm in the middle of filming the Ball Python movie which is coming up really soon. I'll explain why I'm wearing this vest in that movie, but over here, one of the collectors has found a savanna monitor. This is a really thin, emaciated savanna monitor. This animal is not well. This is absolutely not how they look in the wild. This guy would be carrying on. He would be trying to flee. He isn't even moving. Oh, this poor guy. So when I first saw that tail, I knew that he was emaciated, but oh, this poor dude. In the Ball Python movie, I was talking about how right over there, we're on the edge of destroyed habitat due to palm oil plantations. And that is really killing off all the snails and things that this Savannah monitor needs to rely on. And this is the result of those plantations encroaching on wild habitats. This is a monitor that unfortunately is not long for the world. Oh, look at how Thin he is. Look at that. And he is not even moving. He is not even carrying on. He is alive, but just barely. Oh man, is that sad. Right over here, this is the edge of the habitat. And this is habitat destroyed for palm oil. They burn this habitat. They plant only a few trees, all for palm oil. And look at this. This is a burnt out African giant land snail. This is what savanna monitors are eating out here. This whole field has these burnt snails that succumbed when they burnt this field, all for this damn plant. So I absolutely implore everyone watching this to read the ingredients on your food products and do not buy anything with palm oil. It's gonna be hard because palm oil is in all of our food. 
but I implore you to read the ingredients and boycott anything that has palm oil. I am sitting right in the middle of the evidence of the damage that palm oil does. That monitor lizard over there is emaciated again because all of its food source was burned when they burned this field just for palm oil. Please boycott palm oil. This is how damaging it really is. Okay. There we go. We're just gonna let him go, go back, back in. Let him go back? Yep, let him go back in. That is just absolutely heartbreaking. So if you leave the savannah monitor's natural habitat and come into the cities like here in Lome, Togo, what happens to the savannah monitors that are found within close proximity to these cities? Well, we're here right now at a little pub just outside of Lome, Togo, and this is what happens if you're a savannah monitor that lives close to a city. So this is a little kitchen right here on the edge of the pub. You can get uh, chicken here. You can get guinea fowl here. And you can also get Savannah Monitor here. All right, so here is how they cook Savannah Monitor. And so you and this is a, like a peanut sauce, isn't it? Yeah, peanut sauce. Yeah, that's Savannah Monitor. So they'll cook the Savannah Monitor in a peanut soup and they'll just basically let the Savannah Monitor stew in this peanut broth. And then when you order it, you get a chunk of Savannah Monitor and you get some of the peanut broth. And if you're wondering how Savannah Monitor tastes in this peanut soup, I have no idea and I'd never wanna know. So here on the border between Togo and Benin, I was brought to this place because I was told that this is actually a Savannah Monitor nursery. This is the place where a lot of Savannah Monitors come and lay their eggs. And right now, those Savannah Monitors should be hatching. We got some hatched eggs. And Savannah Monitors, look at that. Oh. This is a Savannah Monitor nest. <laughs> this nest just hatched like today but look at this little savannah monitor here so all the other savannah monitors in this nest have hatched and they're now out somewhere but this little guy was the last one left in that nest so essentially this whole place that i'm in right here there's little holes all over the ground and there are savannah monitor nests all over this area so it's something about the amount of heat the amount of humidity and the amount of security that the savannah monitors have in this area. And that is why so many savannah monitors are choosing to lay their eggs in this area. All right, so we found another savannah monitor nest in here. I wanna know what these eggs are incubating at. So I'm gonna stick this probe right down the hole like that. And we're gonna get a temperature reading here and a humidity reading. Look at that, that humidity is still climbing. And it's leveling off at about 97.7-ish and 90 degrees Fahrenheit in this Savannah monitor nest, which again is 32.5 degrees Celsius. That is the temperature that Savannah monitor eggs are incubating at. All right, so we're gonna leave this nest alone and we're gonna move on and see if we can find some out here on the surface here now that it's cooled down. Look, 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 here's a little baby Savannah monitor that was just out and about here. Oh man, so these nests are hatching right now with all these little baby savannah monitors running all over this place. This is what you call incredible timing to find these little baby savannas running around like this. And look at that, he is still covered with dirt. This guy just emerged just now. And it's evening time, so the temperature is cooling down. And that's when these savannas are taking advantage of those cooler temperatures to emerge from the nests. When these guys hatch, look at this, they're no bigger than my finger. And these guys are gonna grow into adults that are gonna be about three feet long. Man, this is awesome. All right, little guy. We're gonna put you right back down and let you go on your way. There you are, buddy. Have a good, happy life in Africa. So this is what we're looking for. This is another Savannah Monitor nest that's hatching out. And this tiny little hole, no bigger than the size of my finger, that's the exit and that's where baby savannah monitors are crawling out of this nest. So this nest right here is probably already hatched and again 
That little hole that you see there, no bigger than the size of my fingertip, that's the exit of the Savannah Monitor Nest, and that's where the babies are crawling out of. So these guys just hatched here. They're still in the nest. But here, come here, buddy. Look at this one. Look at the pattern and the white spots on this one. That is a really nice looking baby Savannah Monitor. And then look at these guys. This one's a little bit bigger. Still nice spots on these monitors. All right, so because we excavated this hole, we're gonna get these guys out and we're gonna just let them go over there and we're gonna fill this back in. But these, uh, all these guys that I'm with right now, they were kind enough to bring me out here to kind of excavate some of these nests so that we could see how Savannah monitor nests look and how their eggs look and the babies that are hatching just literally right now. All right, so uh, <laughs> all right, so the sun is going down and it's getting cooler out here. We've got to get back before dark, but it was really cool to see these baby savanna monitors hatching and to get temperature readings so that we now know what the humidity and the temperature readings are for wild savanna monitor egg incubation out here in the wild. But from here, we're going back into Ghana and we're going to continue to see how the savanna monitor is living out here in the wild. And now, what are savannah monitors doing out in the dry season? Are they going completely dormant? Yeah, the dry season, they're no moving. They are no moving. They are staying at one place. Because when they're moving, the snake can take in them. Sure, they can get eaten by snakes if they're out of their burrows and yes. they're exposed to predators. That's it. That's why they are hiding for, for the tree. And the dry season, when you go, like in January, you can saw 10 on the tree top or six, eight, nine in the tree. They are hiding. And that's in the dry season? Yes. So they're taking to the trees yeah. in the dry season? Up to three months. For, so for three months in the dry season, yes, no you're tree. actually finding them up in trees? Yes. All right, so you mentioned earlier that savannah monitors are actually found up in trees. Yes. And uh, this is one of the trees that you sometimes find yes. savannah monitors in. And why are they choosing this tree? Yes, you know, these trees, he have many branches, so he can hide himself, nothing can see him. He can keep it here to three months. Three months up in a tree? Yes, no eating, no, no drinking. They actually spend three months of the year yes. up in a tree, Yeah. and they don't eat and they don't drink when they're up there? Yes. So I'm working with some Manchester man. His name is Daniel Bennett. Yes, he is so, the master at Savannah it. Monitor Research. I told him, Savannah Monitor Lizard, they are, they are making fasting for three months. He say I'm lying. <laughs> so he try to get one and kill it. And look in the stomach and, and nothing. Nothing, empty, empty, empty stomach. Empty. But you saw something like a um, water. He make it like a gum. Yeah, you so see? it's the bile, Does but it. there's nothing else. Does it? Nothing like it, food inside. No anything in the stomach. And then it, because before it trusts me, what, what I'm talking is true. So, what time of year are they going off of feed and living in the trees for three months? Is that in, that's in the dry season? Yes. So, so the dry season like this, they keep in January. January to about this time of year. Yeah. Guys, I gotta say that out of all the videos that I make, the In the Wild series is my favorite type of video to make because I'm lucky enough to be able to travel the world and come out here to the wild and see how the descendants of our domestic pets are actually living in the wild. And every time I make these videos, I do them to educate, but every time I'm here, I also add to my knowledge base of what these animals are doing out here in the wild. I had no idea that savanna monitors took to the trees in the dry season and went completely off food and drink. I never knew that before. But uh, comment below and let me know if you guys knew that before or am I just the last horse to finish the race here. 
that's been known to happen. So a real quick review of what Savannah monitors require to live long, happy lives in your home. Huge enclosures, lots of soft, loose substrate for them to dig and burrow in, a really hot, hot spot of about 120 degrees, and the UV, that reading was off the charts. So when you're designing your enclosures, be sure to put the hot spot over one third of the cage so that you have a hot side and a cool side for them and put in a really strong UV bulb and put that on the same side as the hot side so that when they're basking in that heat, they're also absorbing all that necessary UV light. Savannah monitors are really rewarding to work with. They are so chill, they don't get very big, and again, they are the world's most popular pet monitor lizard. So as always with these videos, also leave a comment below with a tip or technique on how you keep Savannah monitors so that other people can learn from you as well. And until the next reptile adventure from out here in Africa, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on.